Good evening, good evening to everyone. I'm oh, so glad to have you come and join us uh, this evening here at Mount Calvary. Uh, to all the ones that are here in the Bible study tonight, all the men and women of God that are here at Mount Calvary, uh, to all of our covenant uh, Facebook partners that watch us and chime in Wednesday after Wednesday, we send grace and peace unto you uh, from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. It is good to be in the service one more time. I know there are many other places and things we could be doing at this hour of the day, but we just thank God that you thought it not robbery to join us here at Mount Calvary uh, via social media and you coming out tonight. Uh, we have a wonderful lesson um, that I want to teach you tonight, continuing our series, Experiencing and Overcoming Tragedy. And we all can attest to that all of us who have lived any length of time can say that we've all had to grieve the loss of someone, uh, whether it's a close family member, uh, whether it's a friend, or just you know just someone that we even may not know that you feel the heart and pain of that particular family or situation. It can cause many hearts to grieve. And so what I wanted to do was to put together a series for my class that talks about experiencing yet overcoming tragedy. How does that happen? And so out of all the books I could have chosen to teach this lesson, I decided to use the book of Job because he was a person who suffered some serious tragedy, some tragedies in his life. And so we want to look at Job and take an intense study of the book of Job as it relates to uh, three things. Uh, Job lost everything. That's Job chapter 1, verse 14 through 19. Tonight's lesson we're going to teach, Job grieves his loss. That's chapter 1, verse 20. And then the last part of the series that we'll do in two weeks is Job remains true to God. Job chapter 1, verses 21 through 22. So again, thank you for joining us. I hope this lesson will be a blessing to those who are still in uh, mourning and bereavement uh, to encourage you that you just got to keep your faith and hold on to God and, and let Job be our example tonight of how to overcome let us bow our heads and pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for this opportunity tonight to teach your word. Mm -hmm. Father, we thank you that you have allowed us to be here at this time of the day. It's only by your grace and your mercy that we're allowed to live, move, and have our being. And so, Father, we ask that you will open our minds, open our hearts to receive uh, the revelation of your word. And God, we pray that it will be more for informational purposes, but it will be healing for the soul. God, we ask that you will bless each and every person that has come out to Mount Calvary tonight and bless the ones that are watching us via Facebook and listening by teleconference. We give it over to you now, our hearts, our minds, and our thoughts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Brothers and sisters, two weeks ago, we talked about how this man, Job, how he was the most prosperous man uh, of his time, of his era. The Bible decrees that he was prosperous in his 401k package. He was prosperous in the things and the material possessions that he owned. The oxen, the cow, the sheep. God even prospered him and his wife with ten children. He was the most prosperous man, I think the Bible decreed, of his day. In other words, to set the context of experience and overcoming grief, he had everything. There was nothing that Job uh, could ever want. 
He had a good life. Matter of fact, his life was gooder than good. He had an excellent life as it relates to not only his material possessions, but in his relationship with God. He was so much close to God or in love with God that the Bible says when evil came around him, he would run from it. I think the King James said he would extrude evil. That means he would remove himself from anything that tried to separate him from God. But as the narrative continues, and we can say amen to his prosperity, but as the narrative continues, we understand that uh, there was a day when the sons of God presented themselves before the Father. And it kind of gives us a, a revelation of what happens in heaven around God's throne. That the cherubims and the seraphims, they present themselves before God. But also, we discover in Job that there is a pathway for Satan. That Satan entered into the presence of God. And when Satan entered into the presence of God, the Lord asked him a question because the Lord knew it was no good in him. So he asked him a question. Well, where are you coming from? What are you doing? He said, he's going in and up and down the earth, you know, in and out, you know, seeking who he may devour. Right? So that helps us to understand uh, the reality is that Satan uh, is an audience before God. God allows Satan to come into his presence. That means that Satan has no power. He's under the control and authority of God. Amen. To present yourself before someone means that person you're presenting yourself to is greater than you. And so Satan uh, asks the question and God, for some reason, not explained in the scriptures. For whatever reason, God says, have you not looked at? Have you not considered? Have you not pondered my servant, Job? And you know, the age-old question in theodicy is, is trying to understand the justice of God in an evil world. So many people in my time of ministry have asked me, why would God do this? Why would God do this? Why would God, knowing that we have been good to him, we have been faithful, we all have tried to live righteous lives, we say we've been born again, we've confessed our sins, we have an intimacy with God. So what, God, why? Throw me under the bus. <laughs> we'll save it. But the answer to that is it's kind of unanswerable because we don't understand the mysteries of God. But maybe, brothers and sisters that's here, and maybe those who are watching, maybe we can say, God trusts us. God has enough faith in us. That when tragedy occurs in our lives, we would not let him down. All of the things that we do in our praise and worship, and we're going to clarify that in just a few minutes. All of the things that we do in our praise and worship and our service to God, what does it mean when tragedy strikes? What does it mean when tragedy occurs in our life? In particular, when we lose everything we work so hard for. Or in particular, when we lose that, that person that we're the closest to. Is all of our praise and worship sound and fear and signify nothing? Or is our praise and worship really connected to the heart of God? The emotions of God. Well, we get ready to find out. We get ready to find out because the topic of our lesson is experiencing and overcoming tragedy. 
So we know that uh, Satan says to God, or he tries to be, tries to take God uh, as being naive. He says, well, you know, God, if you remove the hedge from around him, see, you protected him. I can't get to him. I've gone in and out, up and down the earth, and I can't get to Job because you have put a hedge of protection around him, praise the Lord. And Satan says, if you remove that, if you take your hand of protection from around him, then I'm gonna make some, I'm gonna make him do something that you didn't think he could do. To deny you, to curse you to your face. So God allowed it to happen. But he couldn't touch his soul. And I'm gonna explain that soul in a minute. The soul simply means, it's a Hebrew word, it simply means the self. You know, it's not a Greek, it's not a Greek word where they think you have a soul. That's a Greek theology. No, we are a soul. <laughs> That's Hebrew. Okay? So you know what happened, all of you, you know what happened to Job. Some unimaginable things happened to him. And we're just going to summarize it because we don't want to get to the meat of the lesson tonight. But uh, he lost everything. I love Garden C. Taylor one of the greatest preachers ever to live. He says his wide window of prosperity turned into a slit of desolation. Wow, that's deep. A wide window, like we go, a wide window turned into a slit of desolation. Everything he had was gone. You read that in Job chapter 1. Read, I think, from 16 down to verse 19. It talks about that. It talks about how Job loses everything. Uh, verses, excuse me, 14 through 19. 14 through 19, he loses everything. Back to back to back to back. He lost his, let's see, he lost his um, oxen, he lost his donkeys, uh, uh, he lost his servants. They say fire came down from heaven and burned up the sheep and the servants. And while somebody was still speaking, somebody else came in and said, he lost your camels. You lost those, you know, you lost your servants. And while they were still speaking, somebody said, Your sons and daughters were feasting and drinking wine at the oldest brother's house. And suddenly a mighty wind swept in from the desert and struck the four corners of the house. It collapsed on them and killed all of his children. Killed every, every last one. Lost everything. Brothers and sisters, have anybody ever been through that one year you had everything you could ever imagine because you worked so hard? You had that nice car, nice house, nice clothes, jewelry, whatever, whatever you desired in life, materialistically, you got it because God is just that good, amen? And sometimes God allows us to have things that he really knows we don't need, but he allows us to have it in it. praise be. But then all of a sudden, Something strange and miraculous happens in our lives. We lose it all. A tornado comes through. People have lost their homes. Hurricanes. People have lost their homes. Lost their home. Lost their family members. Lost their money. Bad. How many people have you heard on on TV on that greed? A show called Greed, where people uh, were investing their money into these schemes. He scammed. How many times have we heard that? And they lost their whole retirement fund. Thousands and thousands of dollars gone. This was Job in the modern day era. His 401k package, his financial portfolio was ruined. His children were all dead. His cars were taken away. Our lesson tonight is entitled, Job Grieves His Loss. I'm only, use, I'm only going to use one verse tonight. So out of all that, we sum it all up as saying, Job Grieves His Loss. Brothers and sisters, if you turn with us to Job chapter 1, verse number 20, most of you have my <coughs> syllabus. I emailed it to you. And those who are watching, if you want, to, want my lessons, you just uh, 
type that into our Facebook tonight, and I will send you the lesson so you can follow along with us. So we look at Job chapter 1, verse 20. From the New International Version, it reads, At this, at what? At this, at hearing the loss and grieving the loss of everything I just mentioned. It says, Job got up, tore his robe, and shaved his head. That simply means, in this particular era, when a person is hurt or grieving, they will tear their clothes, shave their head, and more cases than none, they will put on sackcloth and ashes right, as a sign of tremendous tragedy, tremendous grief. But here's the part that we're going to contextualize tonight. Here is the part uh, that is kind of baffling. This is the part that's kind of a struggle or a challenge for all of us who love the Lord. Then, after tearing his robe, then, after shaving his head, after hearing all the bad news about his personal life, he fell to the ground. Now, brothers and sisters, listen, he didn't stand up. It's hard to stand up when you don't lost everything. <laughs> Can I get a witness here tonight? Yeah. Yeah. It's hard to stand up when you lost everything. And it's really hard to stand up when you want to talk to the Lord. <laughs> when you want to talk to the Lord, it kind of your knees kind of bent on down to the ground in prayer. Y'all got it now. Woo! Amen. It fell to the ground in worship. Yeah. In worship. It didn't say he fell to the ground and got mad. <laughs> he didn't fell, fall to the ground and start cussing. He didn't fall to the ground and start doubting. He didn't fall to the ground and just had a pity party. But the Bible teaches us he tore his robe shaved his head, that's a little pity right there, but then he had to do something that was incredible and sometimes something we misunderstand. He worshipped who? He worshipped God. All of our worship goes to God. There's, there's no one else that deserves our worship but God. And you can read that in the Bible and all of the lessons that the Bible teaches us I love Daniel and the lion's den. I love the three Hebrew boys. One got thrown in the lion's den because he was not going to give his worship to another. Three got thrown in the fire and furnace because they were not going to give their worship to another. Israel got punished by God because they gave their worship to another when they built the golden calf. Israel got in trouble when they gave their worship to another because God told them specifically through the prophet, through the prophetic voices, not to intermingle with foreign nations, the Canaanites, the, the Amorites, the Hittites, and they did just what God told them not to do. They gave their worship to another. Even the law is holy, just, and good when it says, Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven images. Nor should you worship them. It says, love the Lord thy God with all thy heart. So let's get to the lesson. Then he fell to the ground in worship. Here's my thought. Feeling terrible when we experience a tragic loss is expected. It's expected when you have a terrible loss in your family or in your friends circle. Although our responses to tragedy may vary, the truth is that when these situations occur, we should all grieve in one way or another. PTSD, that's post-traumatic stress disorder, is a mental health issue caused by sudden tragedy or trauma. And we are not immune just because we know God. There are people that are still dealing with that and they have to have uh, intervention. Thinking such thoughts as such is normal. But Job did not take action based on his thinking. 
So let's stop right there. So when tragedy occurred, he did not react in just the way he felt or the way he felt because that's how we get caught up in internalizing. That's how we get caught up in, in the blame game. That's how we get caught up in self-pity. He did not take action based on the way he was thinking because we must attest to that that if most of us took action on the way we were thinking, something tragic would probably happen to us. But he didn't do that. When tragic moments of depression and grief invade our space, it is essential to remember that we must hold on patiently as we wait for God to work during our circumstances. That's the hardest thing. I'm not going to fool anybody. That's the hardest thing to do is to wait patiently on God when tragedy happens. When things come up against us, when the weapons of, the, of, of Satan comes against us, it is a normal human reaction without the anointing of God to act upon the way we think. That's why people get mad at one another. That's why people have pity parties. That's why people get anger and they unleash their anger on other people. And tragedy begins to happen. Tragedy begets other tragedies. It never helps anything. Y'all stay with me. We've got to remember we must hold on patiently. When you get that phone call, I don't know why it's happened in my family. I got a phone call one day that a cousin of mine was killed in an accident. A young man. I don't know if anybody else has ever gotten that. Don't you know sometimes, y'all know that sometimes when those phone calls come in at a certain time of night and you look at the uh, who calling, you can say, oh no, I know this ain't good news. Because it's not a habitual thing. It normally doesn't happen. How many of y'all, y'all have to raise your hand. You don't have to I know I can't see you on Facebook. Has anybody ever got that dreaded call? Even when somebody's been sick. And he said, man, if I pick up this phone, my whole life is going to change. Right? We got to wait on God to work during our circumstances. And this is what Job did. He fell to the ground in worship. And this is the lesson that we're going to learn tonight. That no matter what the situation may be, and I know it could be a tragic and un unsolicited situation, but we got to understand what that word worship means. We got to go back to the old campground. We got to, brother, look, we got to go back to that song you just saw on Sunday. We got to go back to that sermon, Pastor Gavin, you just preached. Deaconess and teachers, you got to go back to that lesson you just taught. You taught, and you taught us. You said it to us. Those who are watching, you said it to us. We got to wait patiently on God. And then when tragedy happens in your life, show me how to do it. Reveal to me how to do it. Because I want to act on the way I'm thinking. You know, I want to go blame this person, blame this person for what happened to somebody. But you got to act on the way you teach and the way you believe. So what is worship? What is worship? We want to talk about that tonight before we let you go. Because he fell down and to the ground. He didn't just fall. He hit the ground. I don't know how hard he hit it, but he hit the ground. And the Bible teaches us that he worshiped. So, let me start off by saying this. Worship is sharing. If I can start off like that. Worship is sharing, listen closely, that particular time and space with God. Let me say that one more time. Worship is a particular time that is sharing our time and our space with the Lord. Now listen. If y'all look at this board here, those who can see it, you see, in worship, you're sharing. See, you're sharing that time and space with God. Now listen closely. Listen closely. And when you're sharing that time and space with God, people are always going to try to intervene with you and God. See, God is here. This is you. <coughs> This is your moment with God, and people, sometimes consciously and unconsciously, 
are going to try to intervene on you and God during your worship. That's why I said to my church, and I said to my family, and I said to other people, in that time and space with God, right, you can't take anybody with you because you need time to worship. You need that moment to worship because it's between you and God. And let me say something to you, brothers and sisters. Worship doesn't just happen when you come to church. And I'm explaining that. It's that time and that union. Anybody ever been there just you and God? No husband, no wife, no cousins, no friends, no family. Just you and God. And you know what? That space where you and God is so tight that keep it knocking, but you can't come in. Because that's my union with God. Isaiah 26 and 3. And y'all highlight that when you get home. Isaiah 26 and 3. This is how I start off my, my thesis. If I had to do a thesis, this is how I thought started off. It says here, Isaiah 26 and 3. You will keep in perfect peace those whose minds are steadfast because they trust in you. Whose minds are stayed on me. Right? Listen to what Isaiah says. You will keep in perfect peace. Who is you? That's God. Will keep in perfect peace those whose minds are steadfast because they trust in him. So in that time and space is where our minds find peace with God. Oh, that's, that's deep. In that time and space is where our minds are at peace with God. Why? Because we trust God. Because we have a trust and trust is, you know, trust between people is a hard thing to do. Because anybody that li lived in another time has had their trust betrayed, like Jesus. <laughs> like what happened to Jesus. So, in that time and space in my worship moment, that trust with the Lord is very important. And here, before I move on, it says perfect peace. That word perfect peace is not a uh, perfect peace is not a completed peace. It's not complete. It is not a utopia. But perfect peace is that union with God. It is that union with God. Perfect peace whose minds, whose minds, how can my mind stay on the Lord if I'm letting everybody in that time and space? Because everybody got something they pulling from you, right? Everybody wants something, but I just need that perfect peace with God. And then we, from when we have that perfect peace with God, it seems like the situation calms down a little. It seems like it calms down. Here's another thing. Worship defeats woes every time. The two, the two W's. The two W's. Worship defeats woes. Worship defeats woes. So which one is going to which one is going to be preeminent in your life? Woe or wish? Because I'm going to tell you, when you have that time and space uh, and God keeps you in perfect peace, uh, perfect peace, then that worship experience you have with God defeats your woe. Something, something has to win. I tell you, Woes would dominate if you don't have that time and space with God. Stay with me here. Woes, and we all have woes. We all have. We can't lie to ourselves. We all have those woes be moments. But when you get in that time and space with God, it's the worship of who we are 
that takes over and defeats woes. That's why Job, the Bible says that in chapter 1, verse 20, when he tore his robe and he shaved his head, and then if you read the story, he was in sackcloth and ashes, right? When he fell on his knees on the ground, well, I don't know if he fell, he didn't say knees, he said he fell very good at because the definition of woe or a worship is to prostrate oneself. Actually, worship means to kiss, to kiss the hand toward. That's what it means. So he said he fell and he worshiped. See, when he worshiped, he could say, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Bless be his name. So his worship defeats his woes. And I want to say that to all of us that are watching me tonight, that are listening to me tonight, that whatever tragedy happens in your life, whatever it is, remember, don't act on it without thinking. Respond to it in your worship. Because all of us here that love the Lord are peculiar people. Right? We live in the world but we're not of the world. Right? So I would suggest to everybody here to, tonight that whenever you have those difficulties in life, whenever you have that tragedy in life, all of us need to wish. You need to have that shared space, time and space. Here it is again. That time and space with God. You know, and I say this again, you know what people are going to do? They're going to do this. They're going to try to come at you all the time, but you have to say, whoa, wait a minute. I'm going to get to y'all out a while. It's just me and God. Because I need it in my wish because only God can do for us what we cannot do for ourselves. I'm telling you, when you lose a child, when you lose a husband, when you lose a love, when you when I lost fathers and and uh, nephews and my niece, when I lost them, you know, that's not something Trisha loved me to death, but that's not something that Trisha can really help me with. It's only the Lord that can do that. And I appreciate Trisha for giving me the advice to stay strong, but it's only the Lord at that time and space. Okay. Like Job. Worship exposes us. I'm going to write that big on the board so you can see it. Brothers and sisters that's watching me and listening to me tonight, what worship does is it, it exposes us. Y'all know what the word expose means. You're uncovered. <laughs> Worship uncovers us. Worship exposes us. And when it exposes us, we stand there and we find out that we have a need for God. How do you know who you really are or who we really want to be unless we're exposed? That's like you could expose a faith. Have you ever met people that faith? They fake as a piece of cake and phony as a piece of bologna. <laughs> they got exposed. And then when you expose them, they stand there with the mouth wide open. Because they've been living a hypocritical life. They've been exposed. And God says, what is done in the dark shall be brought to the light. <laughs> well, the same thing in our worship of God. It exposes our need for God. Because if it did not expose our need for God... My woes will overcome my wishing. Right? It exposes our thoughts. How do you know what I'm thinking unless I tell you? You know what I'm thinking? You know what I'm thinking of here? It exposes our feelings. Listen, you don't know what I'm feeling unless I expose it to you. Right? It exposes our internal joy. You don't know how happy I may be or how joyful I am unless I tell you how joyful I am. And it exposes our pain that only God knows. So when I say exposes us to God and our need for God, 
right? You don't have to see me in church service to worship. I'm exposed to God when I'm in my home. <clears throat> we are exposed to God when we're in our gardens, when we're in our yards. We're exposed to God when, when we are uh, exercising. We're exposed to God, our thoughts. You know, sometimes I see some of the saints of God, I see y'all walking, taking your walk. I don't know what you think, but God knows what you think. Have you ever been walking to the Lord, just thank you for a good heartbeat? Uh, and you're not, you're not just uh, throwing your hand. I mean, you're just walking. It exposes our feelings, right, to God. Now, I've had people in my ministry say, well, Pastor, what praise and worship is the same thing, isn't it? Praise and worship is the same thing. Uh, and sometimes we use it interchangeably. And it does have, it is synonymous in a lot of ways, but there is a difference. When I put praise right here, we say, praise God from whom all blessings flow. Then we have worship. So they say, well, Pastor, if they're synonymous to one another, And they all pertain to our relationship to God. What is the difference? What is the difference? Because notice, brothers and sisters, the reason I try to contextualize this from Job, it did not say, oh, y'all correct me if I'm wrong. It did not say he fell down and praised God. Right? It said he fell down and did what? He worshiped. <laughs> praise. This is what praise is. Praise is always an emotional outlet or expression of what God has done for us. So it's, it's outward. It's outward. It's an outward expression. You know why it's, it's, it's important to know it's an outward expression? Because you can see it. Mm -hmm. You notice it. You can see it with your eyes, you can hear it with your ears. Right? It's an outward expression, emotional, of what God has done for us. So to praise God is good. And I always wanted to be declared as a praiser. Right? He said, well, Pastor, praise him. What, what can you give us to, as an example to help us? In the book of Exodus, they tell me that when Miriam and the other prophets had got together, uh, when they crossed the Red Sea, mm -hmm. it says that Miriam took a tambourine, a tambourine, and the other prophets, other women got together, and they began to praise God mm -hmm. for deliverance over the Red Sea. Have mercy. Mm -hmm. That's what praise is an outlet. It's an outlet, right? David, when he went down to the house of Obed because of the Ark of the Covenant was there. Mm -hmm. David went and recaptured the Ark of the Covenant to take it back to Mount Zion. But they said David, y'all know the story, he walked <laughs> six paces. And when he walked six paces, he had to put down, what did he do? He danced. You know, we sing that song, Dance Like David Danced. That was an outer expression of the way he felt about the presence of God, which was what they believed was the Ark of the Covenant. Isn't that right? Amen. What we do on Sunday morning when somebody's singing, somebody's praying, and somebody's preaching or teaching, we say praise the Lord, right? Because we praise the Lord because it's an outward expression of knowing that God has been good to us. People scream out. People speak in tongues. People, it's an outward expression. Uh, and no word in scripture says God gives us worship. It doesn't say in the Bible that God gives, it doesn't say God gives us worship. That's not a gift from God. It doesn't say, now, y'all correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm going to stand by this. Worship is not a gift from God, but rather our gift to God. Amen. Y'all got that? God doesn't give us worship. 
we ought to worship because that's our gift to God. So worship is our gift. Worship is, worship doesn't come from, because listen, God don't, you know, really God don't need our worship. But we give it to God because we realize that he deserves our worship. That's the thing with me. Yeah, listen. It's a gift from us to them. Our soul. What is it? Our soul. I just said it. We don't have a soul. That's a Greek theology. We are a soul. Amen. <laughs> That's Hebrew. So, what is our gift to God? Lord, I give my soul to you. What is a gift to God? My soul is my very life line. The soul is the life. The life is the soul. You can't separate one from another. When we die, our soul go back to God. Who gave it? Listen. We sing that song, I'm yours, Lord. I'm yours, Lord. Everything I got, everything I am, everything I'm not, I'm yours, Lord. What does that mean? I'm yours, Lord, is my worship. It's my soul and my life. And my soul and my life don't have to raise my hand like they pray. My soul and life. So whatever you see, Pastor Gavin, whatever we see you saints, those who are watching, wherever I see you in the grocery store, you are walking with you. Get green beans up the shelf. Or potato chips if you mean. I suck I don't need. <laughs> Say, look at walking with your pastor getting a big bag of potato chips that he don't need. <laughs> so we become, it's our soul, it's our life. It's who we are. Listen. While praise is our expression, let me say it again. Praise is our expression, our outward or outlet expression. Uh, worship is, to, is supposed to be our lifestyle. See, my soul and my life, that's my lifestyle. You can't, be, you can't go beyond your lifestyle. You are who you are. You are, you are who you are. So in my worship, that's my lifestyle. So how are you living? How are you living? Some people say, I love the Lord, but let a hypocritical life. Have you ever met somebody that's one way on Monday and they're a totally different person on Tuesday? They thought you were. Are they holier than thou on Sunday? The Lord is good all the time. And all the time, the Lord is good. But on, uh, on Monday or Tuesday, that's a hypocritical life. Worship is our lifestyle. So the way you worship is who you are. That's who you are. I, you can't separate the soul from you because you are a soul. It's your, listen, you are the life. You can't, this is no Dr. Jeff and Mr. Hyde's uh, context. This is biblical. <laughs> Worship is my lifestyle. And that doesn't mean that, that we don't have troubles and trials every now and then, but we overcome them because we worship. He fell to the ground and he worshiped. Listen, uh, whether they engage in worship or not, a true worshiper is still a worshiper. It is something that is what lives. It is more than behavior and attitude. It's more than a specific action to God. It is a way of life that affects a person outside of the outside of the presence of God. Listen, let me say it. It's a way of life that affects a person outside the presence of God. Listen, worshipers that's watching me, that's sitting here watching me here in Bible study. If you worship, don't you know people got their eyes on you? And it affects them based on your lifestyle. So, what do they see when they look at you? What do they see when they look at us? Because right? they get affected. You know why a lot of folk don't come to church, I'm not talking specifically, because they see the same lifestyle in the inside like they see on the outside. <laughs> and so you know what they say? What difference does it make? We're probably still on the outside. Right? 
At least we know the people on the outside. So worship uh, is a life, is our life, I can't get past it, is our life that affects folk who don't know God. You're talking about you want people to come to the uh, knowledge and truth? When you live like you know the knowledge and truth. Right? You can't cuss because they cuss. You can't, uh, whatever, I don't even know what the world does nowadays because I ain't been out there so long. I, I know the 21st century, I know it's got a little different now. We got millennials and Gen Z's and all that stuff. Then you got old folk too. Now you got some senior saints and some millennials and some Gen Z, some Generation X. They all cut up in this closet together. I don't know what the fuck. Maybe I can type in, what the fuck do out there nowadays? I don't know what kind of music. I know what kind of music I used to like, and I still like it a little bit. I don't know what they play. What is a club? They still go to club nowadays. That's still relevant. Are y'all still calling it a club? Y'all call it a speakeasy or whatever? <laughs> what do you call it? Juke joint? <laughs> they went from juke joint to speakeasy to the club. Now, what do y'all call it now? Y'all type that in answer that for me. I'm going to get somebody to sign to do the answer. Listen. We can discern a worshiper. <laughs> Not just by what they do on Sunday in the church. We can praise God all we want. But more often than not, when we go outside the church building, the garment of praise is quickly worn off, worn out. So praise, we can deserve a worshiper not just by what they do on Sunday in the, in the church. We can praise God all we want. You can praise God all you want. I've been serving where you just can't sit the folk down. Like, wow. You know, people shouting and jumping and, and sound and fury and, and emotionalism and sensationalism in church. And it's like, see, like, you'd be like, like 30 minutes. And I don't know if they, I don't know what they did before they came to church. But you, and sometimes I've been known just to say, keep letting go. And I'll get it because people are saved by the word. Faith come by hearing. Hearing by what? Yeah. Not by people jumping up and down the tower, but by hearing of the word of God. Right. So praise, listen, but more often than not, we go outside the church, but the government pay it, praise is quickly worn out. So I've been in church long enough to know. Have you ever been there, brothers and sisters? And I say this jokingly, but actually serious. Have you ever been, been in revival a long time ago? It might happen today, too. When people are jumping and shouting, take up 30 minutes, and then they go outside and start smoking a cigarette. I start doing whatever. You know why? Because it, it's worn out. <laughs> you worn out. I remember there was a time in church, people shouted so much, and you know, praise God, I, I don't judge for they pay. We had to get wheelchairs and roll, roll people out. They put them in a wheelchair. If a woman pass out, put in a wheelchair, throw a garment across, and roll on out the church. <laughs> And then they come back 30 minutes later, they fix up the hair, they get themselves straight, sit back. Y'all ain't said that to me. I wore themselves out and prayed. And I never speak against it. I don't speak against it. Only God knows the heart. I've been to, I've been to charismatic churches like that. They take up all that time. Listen, I went to a church that might to preach. And that Kim Cross song, no, they sat down and got up. They sat down and got up. And... I got up to preach, everybody went to sleep. <laughs> they don't want to sell out. They were old folk too. You don't have to call old folk. They, they saw the charge to keep my hair or uh, I'm moving up Zion's Hill. And I'm looking at the other preacher, looking at me. I'm looking at my watch. I said, Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I don't know why I said, I guess he got them excited again. And they sat down, you know. And I'm not picking up, I'm just telling you reality. They get up and start singing again. I sat back down. Praise the Lord. And I'm, I'm sitting down with my little handkerchief. And I get up to them. And they start singing again. So when I finally get up there, I said, Grace and peace to you from God our Father, Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> Praises, the praise they sell to sleep. 
And how are you going to be saved if you don't hear the word? I'm serious. In contrast to that, worship is something we are. We are. No matter where we are, it's supposed to be our lifestyle. So it is, praise is here, worship never is. It never ends. Jesus said there to Nicodemus in John chapter 4, verse 24, God is what? Spirit. What is a, a spirit can go everywhere at all times. You can't contain it. And his worshipers must worship in the spirit and in truth. His worshipers. Hold on. But hold on. Let me, let, let me make correction this, to this. And y'all know y'all gonna get me funny. God is spirit and church folk. Church goers must worship in the spirit. No, he didn't say God was seeking church folk. He said God is seeking worshipers. Listen, brothers, I say with me: the soul and the life of a man or a woman, but the life, that's what God is seeking. And when you worship, you worship. God is spirit. Say, where I go. And where I go. I am a walking worshiper that hopefully that can affect the lives of others. I mean, that's why Jesus says, we are a light on the hill. That can, that's a worshiper. They cannot be here. You know what a worshiper is? A worshiper is the song of the earth that has not lost its savor. Whatever we worship, we become. Whatever we worship, that's who we become. If you worship a golden calf, guess what? You're going to be a calf worshiper. And then when you go and you see a cow on the farm, you're going to fall down and worship Moo Moo. Okay. <laughs> Y'all ain't said nothing yet. You become what you worship. <laughs> and if you love the stars and astrology, you believe the stars or, or the salvation, you're going to become like a star. Mm -hmm. Listen, worship can change us. While praise can't change a person that much. Worship changes us, not praise. It's the worship. It doesn't have the power to change our behavior. There is a power at least in worship that makes us become that which we worship. Wow. Yes, stay with me here. I'm, I'm done. I'm on. Look. I'm on. I'm on. Look. Look. We become who you worship. So, because we are children of God, we become more like God the more we worship. It exposes us to God. Listen, if we see God as holy, and if I took a qualitative uh, survey, everybody would raise their hand or say amen that we, or y'all can see it tonight, we see God as holy. Amen? Amen. amen? Right. Then he would make us righteous in the Holy of Holies. He would make us holy. Listen, if God is, be, because God is holy, and we worship God in, in the beauty of holiness, then we become like God. Not like God, but we become holy unto God. Let me say it like this. We become holy unto God. Right? If we see him as a healer, how many of y'all see God as a healer? Amen. He will make us healed. <laughs> we become like that. So as a worshiper, I believe, y'all can say amen to this, I believe God is a healer. And if I believe that God is a healer in my worship of who I am, I'm going to live a lifestyle like I know he's a healer. So no weapon that's formed against us shall prosper because God is a healer. Cancer cannot overtake God. HIV cannot overtake God. A COVID-19 cannot overtake God. And I don't worship that stuff. I worship God. I listen. Right? I don't over I don't overreact when a biologist or a scientist say you must take a vaccine in order to live longer. That's a gift from God. I'm not going to deny that. And I thank God as a worshiper that He has allowed people to be smart enough and educated enough about society that it can help us. Not only with COVID, but with polio. Vaccines for polio. Vaccines for tuberculosis. 
those type of vaccines, it helps us. And those who deny that, right, that's the issue. Listen. He will make us heal. That's why I like with 1 Peter. 1 Peter uh, 1, 15 through 16 says everything I wanted to say tonight about worship. He fell to the ground and he worshiped. But just as he called you, just as he who called, but just as he called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. But it is written, be holy because I'm holy. I become what God suggests that we, I, and we become. We become holy. God is holy. That's what it says here. God is holy. He who called us is holy. So be holy in all that you do. Listen, brothers and sisters, as I end tonight, you got to be holy in all that we do. We got to be holy in all that we say, in the walk that we walk, and the lifestyle must be a lifestyle of holiness. Be holy. Be holy. That's what it has to be. You cannot separate that word from who we are. We're not just anybody. We're holy people. Be ye holy for I, your God, am holy. And how do you become holy? Let me go back to it one more time. This is how you become holy. You become holy for I, your You become holy. Space and time with God. And some people are not going to want you to spend that. That's why they're on the outside. Knocking at your door. You see, and this sums up, look, this sums it up. Look, this sums it up. Let's get it close. This sums it up. That time and space with God and that worship that Joe had. You remember? Satan? Here's Satan. Here's Satan. You remember he said he was going to and fro on earth and see who made him out? He said, I can't get to Joe because you have a what? Hey, I'm trying to intervene that time and space with Joe, but I can't get in there because you put that around him. And Satan says, I'm trying to get in there. Satan came from the north, south, east, and west and couldn't get in. Because then he said he was going up and down to and fro on all the earth. And then he saw this man, Joe. And Job had that time and space with God because he eschewed evil. He kept evil out of his life. Right? right? Until God allowed this right there. God allowed that to happen. He allowed that head to be removed. Worship comes to a place where there is quietness. Let me go back here one more time. The Lord is in his holy temple, let all the earth make racket before him. Y'all look at me like, you don't know what he's talking about. The Lord is in his holy temple, let all the earth quick keep what? Quiet. We don't sing that song a lot. Blessed quietness, holy quietness. Oh, y'all better watch out now. We get ready to say Facebook. <laughs> We move from praising in which vocal and emotional sounds arise into who he is in our spirit through worship. Because we make contact with him, words are no longer the order of the moment. In praise and worship, words are usually used. In worship, there is quietness. So when you walk out the door on Sunday morning, when you walk out of here tonight, I want to encourage somebody that you are true worshipers. And find that place in your heart. Find that place in your mind. Find that space in your home. Wherever you are, as a walking worshiper to commune with God, have that time and that place with the Lord. And then you too, or we too can be like Job to overcome tragedy that we're experiencing. He fell to the ground. 
If you receive his word, put your hands together. Let's give God some praise. Thank you. Um, in two weeks, we're going to talk about Job remains true to God. On the 29th of this month, we're going to talk about Job remains true to God. Job chapter 1, verses 21 through 22. Again, we thank you for joining us tonight. May the Lord continue to bless you and keep you in his care. We pray for all those who are having some sort of tragedy in your life. We pray for those who are not having any issues in life. Maybe every day, uh, today was a good day for you. We thank God for that. We thank God that you were able to join us. And, we, and I pray that something was said uh, in your hearing to help us to have a closer walk with the Lord. We pray for all of our members, all of our covenant partners. We pray for healing of the ones who lost loved ones, that God continues to heal you in your mind and in your heart. And we just thank God that uh, we have a church we can come to where the Holy Ghost lives. And not only in this building, but in our hearts and in our minds. Again, God bless you. Let us bow here in prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for this day. Father, we thank you for allowing us to come together as a church family, whether it's uh, in faith or whether by social media. Uh, whatever it is, God, we just thank you that we're alive to open our ears, our eyes, and our minds to hear this, your word. And Father, we thank you for, for us being praisers and worshipers. We thank you, God, that collectively working together, we acknowledge that you are the creator and the head of our life. Now, Father, because of that, continue to help us to become holy unto you. Father, we pray for all of those who are going through. We pray for our community. We pray for our local, <coughs> national, and, and regional governments. Father, we pray for healing and an end to a senseless war overseas in two countries. Uh, Father God, we pray for those in our inner cities who are still fight against drugs and alcohol. And, and Father, we just need you right now. Father, we believe that the prayer of the righteous shall avail it much. And Father, we believe that prayer can go and do things that we cannot do. So God, I lift all of these situations up in prayer. And again, I thank you, God, for watching over us and keeping us. If it be thy will, God, we look forward to coming out on Friday at 12 o'clock. I call to get our words of encouragement and prayer. And God, if it be your will, keep us all night long. Let us get good night's sleep so we can arise in the morning. Prove and to show that we are true worshipers. In Jesus' name.